Jesse Williams is an actor, director, and activist. He's best known for his role as Dr. Jackson Avery on the medical drama television series, Grey's Anatomy. He's also worked as a director, producer, and writer on various projects in addition to his acting career. Williams is an active social justice advocate and has been involved in various initiatives and campaigns related to education reform and racial equity. He's currently ending a Broadway run in the breakaway hit, Take Me Out. Franklin Sermons is an American art historian, critic, and curator. He is currently the director of the Paris Art Museum in Miami and has held senior positions at prestigious institutions such as the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Santa Monica Museum of Art. Sermons is considered an expert in contemporary art and has curated and organized numerous exhibitions that have been critically acclaimed and widely attended. He is also a regular contributor to various art publications and a sought after speaker in the art world. Now I got both of those intros from chat B GPT. That's, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. They did a good job. But what they didn't say <laughs> right, is that both of these brothers, and I do consider them my brothers, have huge hearts and they have an unflinching commitment to our fair representation, our causes, and our people. Dante's, please give a round of applause to Jesse Williams and Franklin Sir. Thank you, Toro, thank you. Thank you, Dante's. Um, thank you for all that you do and all that you bring to this conversation here in Miami. We met at a, uh, a little gathering with our friend Bobito um, several years ago and Ever since that, you know, with the with Dante's coming on, this place as a place of bringing people together to commune and to find a place for dialogue is is there's no better synergy. That's what we're trying to do at the museum each and every day. We have staff, we have trustees, we have patrons. Thank y'all for being here, and thank you for all that you do uh, to continue to to build what I think is a dream sometimes, mm -hmm. but a dream that we're all cons making reality. So thank you all. Jesse, thank you for being here. It's uh, a, a truly an honor to be able to be here in this space with you and to think about a little bit about your journey. And also, ChatGPT got one thing wrong. The Santa Monica thing is wrong. I, I don't know where that came mm -hmm. from. But yeah, LA, you. LACMA, totally spot on. That's and right. that just reminds me that it was about 10 years ago that we did a little interview or a panel discussion about the state of black art in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's already a decade probably, yeah. Amazing. We have um, beautiful children in this mm -hmm. time period, so fantastic about that. Congratulations on the ending run of, of your recent Broadway hit, and uh, there's a lot more to come. Thank you, thank you very much. But we have a moment. And we're going to talk a little bit about art. Let's do it. What What was the first thing you saw that you said, oh, this is art, or you knew that this was something special? Well, um, I grew up, my, my mom was an artist. Uh, I grew up in Chicago. My mom was a student at Art Institute of Chicago. And um, her whole family, they're all artists, boat builders, painters, sculptors, dancers. Um, we were only allowed to make presents instead of buy them, also because we didn't have any money. But but it was also uh, uh, my mom's family, big New England, woodsy, artsy, creative family. So art was everywhere. We have, you know, we painted on an easel in the in the crib with a you know shirt dress shirt on backwards, you know, like a smock. And me and my brothers all have the same photo in the same smock, painting on the same easel. Like so, art was always we were surrounded by it. Posters of prints of great works. Um, and my mom's paintings everywhere, and, and, and she's a ceramicist as well. So I was always surrounded by the, not just art, but the human and personal and familial connection of the people who make the art. We, mm. as if it wasn't this distant thing, right. is my point. I, I was, it, it, I was yeah, and it was, it was part of us and something that can be done. It was attainable, it was real, it was tangible. Um, so so that's, that was always present. Yeah. And then that transitions into kind of my lo love of literature in high school and other forms of art, poetry, when I discovered Nikki Giovanni and William Carlos Williams and all these amazing mm -hmm. writers and um, my bad attempts at trying to do something similar and, and falling in love, of course, with the evolution of hip hop. Uh, you know, being somebody born in 1980, I was, you know, it, I grew alongside it in the 90s where this huge explosion Absolutely. of um, literary prowess in terms of writers and hip hop. 
you can have a direct connection to these makers. Right. You already know them. Right. And, and, it, and, and my entry, I think, psychologically was helpful be, uh, with her guidance because it wasn't uh, about acquiring. It wasn't going and getting something as some kind of status thing. It was supporting artists. How do you support emerging artists right. and help to embolden their practice, learn from their practice, and the, the greatest gift that is born of that is what it gives you, right? It is a reciprocal exchange. Yeah. Of wh how, do we, how do we call something art and, and what is um, something that is accessible? Um, I think sometimes there's a, a difference and people don't necessarily see prints and posters as being the art per se. Uh -huh. but, to see, but to hear you speak about that and growing up with that around, it kind of gives you a space in between high and low or, or was there any? Yeah, as a, I mean, look, you, you know, it, we're, as a young person, it's, it's the image. I see the Tanner piece, I see the uh, Matisse, I see Basquiat, I see whatever. A lot, also I grew up a lot around a lot of propaganda art, a lot mm. of revolutionary propaganda art, Panther stuff, communist, socialist agenda, working people, labor union, organizing material. That's art as well. You know, it's, um, uh, so, it wasn't about what is it the original is it the yeah. one of one it's the image and how does it make you feel I, I think about when you're in that junior high high school age making i was you making collages in your room right like slapping together cutting cutouts from source and vibe and national geographic yeah. and putting them together and telling stories and making mixtapes i would always cut out pictures of magazines put them on mixtape like that's all using a visual language using an artistic language to support and express and reflect how you feel or aim to feel and it's all valid it's all equally valid Absolutely. um uh so no i didn't there was I, no difference between oh but also that said i was also nowhere close anybody anywhere close to being i didn't nobody owned art i never heard of that right. it's in a museum but i don't i wouldn't know anybody that knows anybody that knows anybody that could afford to own a piece of art that is worth more than Two hundred dollars. I, I, I hesitate to say worth, but you know what I mean. Like, so that was something that didn't come to my consciousness until early adulthood. And you talked a little bit about how that art in general set you up for the life that you have, the life that you lead, um, and dabbling in in other parts of making art. Yeah. Um, when did acting become the the tool or the medium? Acting started for me when I was almost thirty. I think uh, I was twenty eight when I. Uh, first got a, my first job acting I was um, you know as a public high school teacher I worked in law firms for years in New York and waited tables and was a bartender and I hustled jobs off Craigslist lying about the skills that I had just to try to get <laughs> saying I'm proficient in everything just to get a job I was a temp I was an assistant I worked in a label factory I was a grip on sets I was running around as a DP, like a director of photography for student films and just collaborating with people, just trying to figure it out in Philly and New York and um, uh, tutoring and studying to teach the uh, Princeton Review classes. Just education was always somewhere in there. Like how can I, I you know, I was raised in a, um, nothing really mattered to my dad unless you're in service to black people like mm -hmm. what are you doing for black folks what are you doing for working people mm -hmm. um nothing else impressed him and and that was what changed my life and what was really interesting to me was always education and african history and um knowledge both for myself and for others so that was always somewhere in there mm -hmm. uh but uh i didn't acting was born out of um knowing that I had creative muscles that I was not exercising. And if I stayed in the grind that I was on, I would just grow to resent myself mm -hmm. and those around me um, if I didn't try. Exactly. Um, and also, uh, you know, so that became like trying out for commercials and, and acting and that was, but that was also very much a hustle. Like I saw that how much money they made and I was like, okay, those margins are good. Mm -hmm. I can do anything. Mm -hmm for being real, like if they can do that, then I can do that. Mm -hmm. And, and I grew to, I, I fell in love with it later. I didn't, it wasn't okay. born out of love. I had no desire to act as a kid. I didn't know that was a real job. I was, it kept me from selling weed and, and doing other things. Like it was just another way to figure, be creative and make some money. And yeah. then I fell in love with it and realized that it's part of the process of storytelling. And film is a lens through which most of us discover the world.
Right uh, you know, like that's we, TV and film is how people learn about race and gender and orientation and history and whether you're, you're mostly being miseducated, but you're learning something. You, so you think there's not much of a difference between thinking you're learning something and learning something. <laughs> Your body doesn't know the difference. So um, I just wanted to be involved with that. Right on. And, and that, at that point, when you figured out, um, OK, there are resources here to, to be involved with visual art in a different way, um, you mentioned Cheryl. Yeah. To, I, I've known Cheryl for uh, years and, and um, you know, through my stepmother who worked in the entertainment industry, it, it was a conversation that was there. And I know for, for her as an advisor and as a maker, um, she seems to place art in the same service of, of education that you talked about. Yeah. How did she bring you to collecting, though, as, as an advisor? Uh, I mean, she framed it in. It is a it is a beautiful way to spend your time and energy and educate yourself and contribute to the incredible makers around you. And so I will. So she made herself available to just be school. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put you on to what's happening, where it's happening, what to go see. I'll take you to exhibitions. I'll talk you through them. I'll send you everybody's pedigree. What the, who's invested in their who's really invested in their practice. It doesn't mean they had to go to Yale. It doesn't mean they had to go somewhere that that might be cool. That might be a demonstration of investment. Sure. Totally valid. But there's plenty of people that had different paths. And I'll get you. I'll just help you get a sense of the landscape. It's um, get you literate. Right. Get get your weight up. We get to learn the vocabulary, learn what things mean and what they don't. And um, when like just just because you got to you got to swing to hit the ball, you got to try and you got to make mistakes and, and go for something, you know, and, and always juggle. She never was always, she was never unclear about uh, buy, spend time with and buy what you love. Yeah. Don't think about what it could, what you could flip it for, what it could never get involved in that space. Yeah. It's uh, that's that um, that doesn't last yeah. uh, and it's not healthy for the community. You, you mentioned um, Tanner and, and so Henry Asawa Tanner. Uh -huh. Many of us had that picture, the, the banjo lesson yeah. I know was on my wall. Yep. Um, so what was the first artist that touched you who was speaking in a contemporary sense? I mean, Tanner takes us back to them. Sure, in a contemporary, like a, in, a, in my, my age group, so uh -huh. to speak. Uh -huh. um, damn. Um, I'm going to say... As a, as a painter, maybe when I actually started thinking about collecting and going to see this, probably Lynette, mm -hmm. but, it, but as an artist, I think the most profound impact uh, was Hank Willis Thomas. Okay. Like it just, the play and density of the image making um, just got my attention very quickly. And uh, I was lucky enough to, we, we met soon after I kind of fell in love with his work at the Hammer, actually, at an event. Uh, uh, his mom, Deb, introduced us. And that was, again, through Cheryl. And that would have been around what year? This was a, right when I moved to L.A., so this is 2009. Okay. okay. So this is 2009, maybe, two, maybe 2010. Yeah. Yeah. Two very different artists, two amazing yep. artists, right? Lynette, um, painter. I mean, we have a big painting up in the museum right now, I can't mm -hmm. wait for you to see. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I recall one of the paintings that you have of her work. Um, <laughs> what, what I recall the one that I it? didn't buy that I should have. Okay, that's also. A, also a good lesson. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, huge, insanely beautiful work that I couldn't fit in our little apartment. I didn't really know where to put it, but I, I, I could have got it for like nine grand and it's worth a <laughs> million dollars or something exactly. right now. Like. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah. But you got one. Yeah. Curious, like, you know, we, we talk about um, collecting a lot and singular pieces. So what was it, you know, with her work that spoke to you when you made the decision to actually acquire the work as opposed uh, to just love it? Sure, sure. Um, to, to, from love to being able to mm -hmm. love, being able to afford it, but actually pulling the trigger, so to speak. The first work I ever bought was a Shanique Smith, oh. um, a really dope. Yeah, I love, as a person also, she's just yeah. the most wonderful. Um, but uh, Lynette was very likely the first painting. Mm. Um, and uh, it was, 
what it was, mm -hmm. was the unsolved mystery of it. Mm. And that I hadn't, I can't, I didn't see it all in a glimpse. There's something new to discover in it. And one of the things I love about figurative work, which is the, you know, the bulk of my collection, is they're souls, they have energy, they're people I live with. I sit and go and sit down and have a glass of wine and chill with the work in my house. And, and it's a movie and I see different scenes and I play things out and I'm having a conversation with them. Um, it's energy, it's us. It is, the, it is, it's, it breaks every stereotype of this, you know, homogenous group thing that is blackness, which is a fiction, right? It yeah. is like, there's just all the incredible characters that uh, we love or haven't yet discovered, you know? So the, the unknown of the work that, mm -hmm. that the acquired then was just, there was always something new. I don't even know if it was, is, is it a man or a woman? Is she old? Is he young? Like, what, what, where is the set? And the, the, just the subversive relationship of asking a question, which admits that you don't know the answer. And, and there's just always room to grow. There's always room to grow with the work. And that's something I look for, I think. Mm, that, that is beautiful. Um, did you know her when you? No, nope. no, no. We, we met probably not too long after. And, and that, that reminds me of uh, 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 Joanne Bellarado, who, you know, mm -hmm. she was also a, just a critical yep. sounding board and peer and friend and beautiful person that was always there Absolutely. also and I introduced to her through through uh, both um, Cheryl and and uh, mm -hmm. my ex-wife was with it the and time. then on the other side though with somebody like Hank it was it was a little bit different where you actually got to know him yeah before buying the work yeah yeah uh, yeah I it was well I didn't even buy a work from him for some time we just we, we, we met at an event and immediately just hit it off talked all night Followed up, email, grab a coffee. Then I jumped on as a producer in Question Bridge. We took that right. thing to Sundance and all over the world, all over the country, and have been, you know, it's one of my very, very best friends ever since. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, and, and we have so much overlap with so many other people, but that, yeah. And that yeah. just goes back to the beginning of what you were saying about that. The active part of collecting and being a supporter in many different ways beyond yeah. the transaction. So with Hank, tell us about Question Bridge. That was Question Bridge. Project. Question Bridge is an incredible project that, uh, okay, we traveled around the country interviewing uh, people who identify as black men, right. kids, right. adults from any walk of life. Right. And it's really this uh, talking head scenario. We just, it's just the frame, like the intro to the Brady Bunch. Y'all remember there's just heads in a, in a blank space. So we traveled, we interviewed, uh, folks all over the country, ask them a, to ask a question, look into the camera, ask a question you have had mm. of other black men, of a different walk of life, same, whatever, any question you've always wondered. Um, and after you ask a question, we'll also play you back some other questions we found and you get to answer them. Again, into the ether, you're gonna have this, it, it turned into this very public, private, in-group conversation amongst men. So you have, you know, something, innocuous, a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old kid saying, how do I tie a tie? How do I know when I've become a man? You've got a 45-year-old brother going, why don't we go to the doctor? I begged my brother to go to the doctor and get his colon prostate checked and he refuses to go. And then he finally did and it's too late and I just buried him. Why the fuck don't we go to the doctor? Uh, it's a young brother going, you know, I know you old heads look down on us. You don't like the way we wear our hair and our music, the way we sag our pants. And you always look down on us and we can feel that, but why didn't you leave us the blueprint? Mm -hmm. We don't know what we're doing. Black men were stripped out of our communities throughout the 80s and 90s we, that don't have authority over us, that aren't cops or coaches, like help. <clears throat> Instead of just looking down, it doesn't feel good. What an interesting, profound question. And we play that to men all over the, all over the country that are doctors that are in uh, San Quentin that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, wherever in the hood, young people, old people, like I said, Republicans, Democrats, churchgoers, atheists, whatever, gay, straight, whatever, mm -hmm. and um, play them back those questions and they answer. So we ended up with this 150, right. you know, hours of conversation amongst these men and we curate them. We put them together, put them on these 10 foot pillars, five pillars, about 10 feet high, semicircle and put them up in Brooklyn Museum, Schaumburg wherever, and you can go and sit and watch this conversation amongst these men. They look left, they talk, they laugh, 
You know, am I the only one that feels uncomfortable eating chicken or watermelon in front of white people? <laughs> oh, and if people laugh, and that's ridiculous. No, I eat extra in front of them. Yep, you're right. Not only do I, I, I actually don't, because I, this guy said, because I'm gay, I, I feel that way about bananas. Never thought of that. Whoa, never thought of that. All this, all this interesting micro yeah. little moments that was this really connective thread amongst this demographic that is, you know, so mythologized and falsely feared and lied about and misrepresented. And it just has so much heart. And most importantly, it was honest. It was unfiltered. There was nobody, nobody's changing anything, but, but um, it gave access um, for ourselves. This isn't about mm -hmm. white folks. It's mm -hmm. about us being able to experience and celebrate and see ourselves in museums. We had these mm -hmm. big events all over the country. It was huge. At Sundance Front, New Frontiers was wonderful enough to have us there. And um, uh, it, was, it was very profound. We're really, really proud of it. It's in the permanent collection at the Smithsonian in DC, our Smithsonian. Um, and uh, yeah, that was the first project uh, I did with Hank and, and Chris Johnson and Bayate Ross Smith and Kamal Sinclair, a uh, great group of folks. It's massive. Yeah. That is absolutely massive. And, and the way that it brings together all of the things that, that you talk about as being foundational. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, and, that, and it's also, uh, for me, it was a great kind of experience in the role that video art, moving images can play in the art world. As you know, somebody who was a film major and African American studies major in school and in college and then came on, you know, became an actor and producer and director. But there it was, you know, I think of the fixed image, yeah. photography, painting, whatever, but what, what the hell is video art? What is, what is that? Right. And what is art? And, who can, and does it matter, why would it matter if it's moving or not? Okay, so what, what, do you, what does it make you feel? Um, and, and uh, so that was, it was a nice, my point is just, it was this cool intersection of academia, yeah. history, so sociology, so everything, yeah. and, 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 and fine arts, expression. It's captivating, makes you feel and, and think. Incredible. Um, you, have, you have done uh, so much in such a short period of time. I mean, just thinking about the arc of career, but just keeping it focused on, on the art aspect. Uh, is there, you mentioned a piece that got away and... and uh -huh. <laughs> Does that happen often, or is it only that li that one Lynette? Uh, Lynette? No, I, the goal actually, frankly, is for that for that to happen every day, because I need to calm the hell down and stop <laughs> spending so much money on art, um, which I have been good about. Uh, <laughs> speaking of Cheryl, the amount of times I got to go like, yeah. Cheryl, stop! I'm on break. I can't acquire anything else. The way my bank account is set up, that's not going to work. Um, but uh, yeah, that that happens. It happens plenty of time. It happens plenty of times, but it's also, um, I don't, I don't sell anything. I haven't right. sold a work, so it's not like it's, it's not part of my. It's not an yeah. economic part of my experience. It's just kind of the, you're, you're, um, learning yourself and learning your taste and learning if what I think is somebody who's really well invested in themselves and has special talent, and I think a market will respond to, which is a very tricky thing to to predict and it shouldn't matter but yep. the, so you're all these all these intersecting factors does it play out oh that, that, that feel yeah that feels good i saw that coming mm -hmm. it's like you're putting somebody together you think your home girl will go will you know will love her you know there'll be a great match and i thought so that works or that was that went horribly i was really wrong <laughs> or there's a lot of ways that could play out so yeah plenty of times I, i'm usually right though <laughs> I, 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 I'm usually, I'm, I'm, I've got a pretty good track record of, of feeling like I can tell who's uh, going to find a space to grow. And that's the fun thing about studio visits and spending time with people. Everything is a collaboration. Us just rapping is going to, certainly going to, I'm going to walk away with a new idea. And you probably are too. And whether you do something with it now or in six years or six months is, is Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Um, thinking about that, that resonance with somebody like Hank, there, there are others. I think Glenn Kaino is somebody you've collaborated with. That's right. With. Both of these artists have really big picture views. There's no such thing as, oh, I'm a painter or I'm a photographer. Um, I know you've spoken a little bit about that kind of mutual respect that I imagine happens, but Glenn is a, somebody who makes art and, and also has trafficked in magic, right? He Glenn Kaino really is magic. a... How did you all come He's together? He's a fucking wizard. This guy is so amazing and so talented, so superb at everything he touches. And he's always doing 20 things at once. Incredible fine artist. 
super high level magician. The way I see him treated in the in the magic world is wild. They like bow to him. He's such a brilliant, generous, wonderful guy. Yeah, him and Hank are very similar in that way. They do can do so many things. They're so giving and generous, and just have extra ideas at all times. Um, Glenn and I met. Uh, I don't know if it was his show, but it was something as a as a patron and as an artist. It was. Uh, uh, being an admirer of his practice and then hitting it off um, kind of uh, in a friendly manner and then uh, picking his brain about, I knew he had a lot of experience in digital. He was a CCO at Napster. He ran all digital for Oprah. And I was uh, looking at apps, the app world. Now we have several um, together. And um, so picking his brain is that, which is a good excuse to sit down and just kind of break bread and get to know each other. Um, uh, both of our daughters are named Sadie. Like we had to say cool stuff in common, sure. and um, and uh, and it's you know I just he's just one of the many people that are these multi hyphenate folks that yeah. I just find so incredibly inspiring, and just it's just a high vibration yeah. thing. It's just a good good to be around. It makes you better, um, and, and I say that in the most. Un, in an unselfish way, right? It's not about what people give to you, but it's a good feeling to be able to give and take and have a really reciprocal exchange with, with the yeah. people in your life. And, and the um, work is about so much. And the work is always layered. It's, there's nothing that's just, uh, that's vanity is involved. It's, it's always a gift um, and about the collective. You know, we, 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 a lot of our conversations are very, very political and just yeah. about how can we be in service um, to, to us and best represent the best of us that a deserve to be highlighted and B are consistently maligned That's or ignored. Line, yeah, right. It is. Is there anything that you're looking to buy anytime soon? Is there like a piece that you have in mind, or is there an artist where you feel like I'm, I need this? Um, n not at the mo moment. I mean, I I miss Noah so much. Yeah, I know. Noah Davis, and um. I don't even know why that came to mind, but mm. it's just, that's what came to mind. Mm. And um, I, I am exploring more abstract mm -hmm. creators. I, like I said, I've always been focused on, I didn't necessarily understand the abstract work I was exposed to. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a reason, but also I, uh, for the reasons I've expressed, I love figurative work. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself, I just got, uh, I've been able to spend some time with uh, Michaela Yearwood Dan. Mm -hmm. She actually came to the play in New York. We got to we got to kick it afterwards. She's dope, and I have just kind of fell in love with her work. Andre, I think, put me onto her work. Andre De Roche, great friend and collector, mm -hmm. and attorney, and um, uh, so I was lucky enough to get be able to uh, get a piece from her that I actually featured in my character's office on Grey's Anatomy. I put I always put black artists up on the walls in that show. By the way, if it if my character is ever in a home or office space, there's black artists that I've paid to have their work up there. And, um, and, but yeah, she's, a, she's, uh, so, so I'm, I'm exploring the abstract, abstract space a little bit more recently. Um, yeah. You mentioned <laughs> Noah. Um, yeah. But that's an artist that you acquired pretty early on. Or? That, that's how we met. Yeah. When I'm looking, sitting in the back room with Lindsay at Tilton, I oh, guess. Tilton. Yeah. Um, and then him and I just hit it off and we would, hoop as he was building the underground when it was like sparse we were just hoop in the back and talk and hang out and and he brought Khalil over to the crib one time and me, me and Khalil have become brothers ever since and yeah so, filmmaker. yeah yeah brilliant brilliant Khalil Joseph yeah Amazing. yeah well you said peace and one that you've been tracking for a while and it does remind me that there um Benny Andrews is somebody who without even knowing his name at first I just was so connected and blown away by the work and there was a specific work called there must be a heaven that was my screensaver. I couldn't believe how transformative, the, how, how it made me feel, how something could be so beautiful and so uh, devastatingly painful mm. simultaneously and so vivid, but yet so un undetailed. I don't know, it was just, it, just, it was just the loudest mm. feeling I had had with a work for some time. It was my screensaver for years and now I own it. I, I didn't know it was that was even possible, but I, but I, I. And that's an artist who comes out of the '60s in a big way, whose work was often paired yeah. with a civil rights conversation. That's right. Yeah, it seems to fit perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. 
It does. Those are things that move me. We are here um, convening for the 10th anniversary of Art and Soul and, and honoring you as a collector. Congratulations, by the thank way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and thank you for joining us in, in, in this excursion. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked about that blackness as being a, a part of, of the collecting experience, too, although, of course, not limited to that. And um, in the future, do you see yourself collecting in different categories or different ways? Is there collecting work that's not from black folks? Yeah. <laughs> um, not, not really. Okay. Uh, uh, there's other people that are already doing that. Right on. Um, I, I have work that is not from from uh, from us necessarily. Uh, I do. I absolutely do work that I love. Uh, it just my focus will never shift. That not this lifetime. Maybe when I come back, I'll do something else. But this one, no, we have, there's so much to explore. I love it, I admire it, and I do. I've, I've got work from folks from all over the world. But um, yeah, we'll be the center of it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. One other thing. Yes, please. You have a new show, right? I'm, I'm working on it. I'm acting on a new show right now, yeah. Right. Murders in the Building, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're recording that now, season three. That's that. Thank you very much. It's very cool because it's all these incredible comedy legends and Meryl Streep's on the show now and Paul Rudd and Tina Fey and Martin Short and um, Steve Martin. So that's the uh, wow. speaking of folks who've been crushing it for decades that you admire that you don't necessarily ever picture yourself uh, looking across the table from and, and being able to learn from in person. Yeah, very, very and pinch me. Already, um, already, already well, I well, I, I learned from I wasn't aware of this. Steve is apparently a monster collector. We haven't even gotten to talk about that yet. Um, there's so many things to talk to them about, but I, I look forward to diving in with him because I've learned I've learned from others that he's just a beast. Yeah. There's this wonderful scene of him roller skating through the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I think it was was it no or is it Ferris Bueller? Really? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna do some research and get back to you on that. Talk yeah. To you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm really honored to be here, and it's such a, it's such an achievement, and it's so. Speaking of you know ascension and growth, to be able to have met you in LA and watched everything that you have developed and the light that you have become for so many of us, um, to make it real, and to be able to build and be in service, but also in celebration and make a life and be a family man and all these things. It's just a beautiful thing to see always. Thank so you. I'm so of course, of course, I was so That's happy to come me. down. That's why yeah. you're here. Yeah. Thank you so yeah, much. Of course, of course. I mean that. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you.